Hey everybody, welcome to The Art of Comics. Today, we're gonna talk about Sandman. Yeah, I'm serious. Are you ready? Okay guys, I'm your host, Andre Salazar. Super stoked to talk to you guys about Sandman. Uh, this is a bound book that I made. Uh, it's a three volume set of one through 75, all the Sandmans that Neil Gaiman wrote and created, Vertigo Comics. Um, I love this series so much. I hunted down all the singles. Yes, I destroyed them to make these bound books because these are awesome. I did this about 10 years, more than 10 years ago. Shoot, like 15 or maybe even 20 years ago. Uh, so before they actually did come out with the omnibuses, but screw it, I don't care. I got my originals, I'm happy about this. Um, welcome to the channel, I'm Andre Salazar. I'm stoked to talk about Sandman. Sandman is probably one of the books that I would say brought in a lot of new readers back in the 90s. Uh, this is the not just the goths, right, and people that listen to Ministry or The Cure, but actually people who weren't into comics came into comics because of Sandman. This was the book that straddled the line of Kitty, four color, fun, and literature. And Neil Gaiman, the Brit, was the guy who came onto the scene bringing that level of writing, right? And um, while Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and some of those guys are brilliant writers, Neil Gaiman comes at it from a little bit more of a literary side, uh, more play kind of style. Um, you know, he's definitely influenced by Shakespeare and, and some of those old, older writings and famous authors. And, and you can kind of see that in his work and the things he likes to write about. Specifically, I want to talk about an issue, a, a particular issue that meant a lot to me that really, when I read this issue, that brought this on the scene. So this is not going to be about all of Sandman. It's going to be a one specific issue. It's going to be issue number 13. It's part four of Dollhouse, and the issue is called Men of Good Fortune. And this episode, this issue, I should say, is really freaking good. And this, to me, brought him on the map. This, to me, made him, me say, oh, crap, this is something different. Um, Dollhouse was, uh, unlike the other ones, Preludes and Nocturnes and things like that, where it was kind of a full story, Dollhouse was like short stories. So they weren't all one big story. They're all, that Trey Dollhouse had like a bunch of short ones. And in Dollhouse has one of my favorite uh, stories, which is the serial, uh, the serial convention, which is serial killers actually. But um, this is just a one shot. This is a 24 pages, great story. And I really want to talk to you guys about it and go into this episode. So why don't we flip the camera and go down and talk a little bit about Sandman, Men of Good Fortune. Let's do it. Okay guys, thanks so much for watching the channel. I appreciate you all for spending a little bit of time with me talking about the things that I love. I love comics. I love the art form, the, the way in which it tells a story, the way it engages the reader and how we, um, are a part of the story and I really enjoy that and so I made this channel because I love this medium this form of communication I try to do it myself and so I study the masters this guy Neil Gaiman is one of the masters uh, the artist on this is Zuli great work you know I was you know I was flipping through this this collection this weekend I thought you know what the the line work, the art style of these artists back here in the 90s is not, we don't see this as much nowadays. It's The art has changed. These Vertigo comics had a different type of pen work, and I really miss it. And maybe it's part of the coloring too, because they used flat coloring, and it's different now. We put so many freaking layers on colors, and and we try to make everything modeled in 3D, but I don't know. You can't beat this kind of stuff. You can't beat this kind of lettering, this coloring, this, excuse me, this line work. Okay, that's 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 my take on the art. Art's great. 
Let's talk about Men of Good Fortune. This episode is... I keep seeing episode, darn it. This issue is one of my favorites of Sandman. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably just pick my favorite issues and just do issues. I'm not going to do the whole freaking Sandman series because it's too much and some of you guys don't want it. So I'm just going to pick the stuff that I think is brilliant. It starts off our tale in the 1200s. We have this uh, tavern that people are at. We hear kind of like little um, murmurings and side conversations of wars and plagues and all these kind of things that are happening. Uh, he's setting up the the location. We're in England. He's setting up the time, talking about this war and plague and, and popes fighting uh, the two popes. So we're talking about in that kind of like Middle Ages era. And of course, the clothing will also uh, clue us in. The clothing will be very important to kind of cement us in that era. And we have Dreaming, who Dreaming has been kind of aloof to man. That's kind of like the premise of... Uh, of the first like 14 issues is that dreaming is a character who interacts with men mankind but only distantly and only through dreams and and has very aloof to mankind where death his sister is much more intimate with mankind and more perhaps compassionate or understanding of man so they go in this uh tavern her goal is for for her, him to kind of understand men a little bit, right? And so I love this line. She's like, well, at least I get out and greet, meet them. I just think maybe it would be good for you to see them on their terms instead of yours, right? So she's about getting into the, getting to mankind's level and, and getting on the ground floor or, or in, the, in the weeds with them. He is always up in the clouds, right? That's kind of the premise of their 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 philosophies of working with mankind. Okay. Uh, and then we hear this character, we're gonna learn about him in a minute. Uh, he's talking about death and he thinks death is a mugs game and, and doesn't care about death. They enter, they're talking about, uh, so we always have this side conversation, these this like uh, periphery characters. Jeffrey, he's talking to Jeffrey, um, He's talking about writing his his poetry and, and writings either in English or in French. And this Jeffrey is actually Chaucer. So the character is, this is the guy who wrote the Canterbury Tales. So this is Chaucer. Uh, so we see some literary kind of masters in the background. And I, I find that's interesting because this whole story will be like that. So they're chatting and this character says uh hob has you know what death is rubbish it's stupid i don't want nothing to do with it i think everybody dies because everyone agrees to it and goes along with it and i'm not gonna die i'm not gonna be a part of this and so they're listening right and and death's like just listen listen to these people and he's like what's what's good for death i don't care i don't want to be i don't ever want to die i'm never gonna die right and uh, they talk about this wandering Jew character, which must be a character in some kind of mythology or literature that I'm not familiar with. And Death gets this idea, like, oh, really? Hmm. He says he's not going to die, huh? He thinks it's stupid to die. Well, let's just play a little game here. And so they're like, well, and this might be interesting. Okay, very well. We'll do it. Do you want to tell him or I'll tell him? And Dream's like, okay, I'll do it. Okay, little brother. So he makes this little, makes this little uh, deal with with this carrot, with Hob, uh, Hob Gadling is his name. And he says, okay, you're not gonna die. We're gonna meet here again, Robert Gadling, in this tavern of the White Horse. We're gonna meet here in 100 years from the day, and we'll see how you do. Now, everyone else's thing is a joke, right? He doesn't know that he has the power of life over death, and he's actually gonna let him prolong his life. And he's like, oh yeah, you wanna live forever? Okay, let's do this. And meet me here in 100 years. Everyone's laughing, thinks it's, you know, he's being a jerk. He's like, no, okay, fine. A hundred years to this day, I'll see you. Okay. So a hundred years to this day. So this is, he said, this is, uh, I'll see you at 1489. 1489, right? So this is 1389. Okay, 1489. Boom. Comes around. A hundred years later. We don't see that. Notice, nowadays we'd have this like annotation or narration saying, 14, you know, 1498, 
but it's not like that. We just, we know by the haircut, we know by the, things are different, costuming. And so he's, he's there with Dream. He's like, how did you know? The coloring got screwed up here because this should be white, but that's okay. <laughs> We're not gonna bust his chops. Uh, how did you know? Who are you? Are you a wizard? Are you a saint? Are you a demon? What are you? He's like, no, I'm just interested. I'm interested in mankind. He's like, so uh, what's going on? I see you haven't died. He's like, no, I've been around here. Uh, he talks about, uh, have you, are you, are you ready to die? What have you been doing? He's like, no, let me tell you, everything's changed. Um, this is now like there's chimneys are happening. You know, the technology is slightly changing in this, in this new world. Um, he's like, no, chimneys are great. You guys don't understand what it was like a hundred years ago, right? So he, he could kind of see society changing slightly. <clears throat> uh, and he's like, do you want to st st stick around? He's like, what do you want to do? Well, I've been soldiering. What have you been doing the last hundred years? Well, I've been kind of fighting for the Lancasters or fighting for York and <clears throat> doing all these different things. Since he can't die, that's a good way to kind of move through his life. Um, and he's like, do you still want to live? Oh yeah. Hundred years? Sure, let's do it. Boom. Next hundred years. So now it's uh, 1598, right? So Elizabethan. You could tell by the clothing too, of course. And now we see him walking in and now we're talking. Now, Kit, your theme is as I saw. Now this Kit and William, this is William Shakespeare and this is Kit. Kit is actually Kit Marlowe Kit Marlowe is a famous playwright, right kind of proto William Shakespeare. <clears throat> he did one or two plays that were really well known and reproduced often. And so he's considered uh, at that time a very popular playwright, but didn't have a lot of different works after that. So he did just a couple pieces that everyone kind of aped. Uh, but you see William Shakespeare and Kit Marlowe talking in the background. Again, similar to before when we had uh, Chaucer, <clears throat> Jeffrey Chaucer talking. So you have this literary component, these uh, authors talking in the background, which I kind of find interesting because as a dreamer or as dreams, these are the playwrights. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll wait. Uh, here's Hob. He's sitting here. He's talking to me. He's like, Hob? I don't go by Hob now. I'm Sir Robert... Gal, Ga, uh, Gadlin. So Robert Gadlin. So, you know, he changes his name. He's now bought himself a, a, a lordship. He's made all this money. So now he's, uh, he's happy about being here in England. <clears throat> he made a bunch of, he made a bunch of money through the Tudor shipyards. He still has some shipping interests. You know, he's living the, the freaking high life, right? He's now over 200 years old. He's loving it. This is like max. Wonderful time. He's checking out his wife. He's like, check out my wife, check out my baby. This is great. You know, all this is wonderful. In the background, we hear this conversation of these two playwrights. And William is talking to Kit, to um, to Kit Marlowe about, hey, you know, I think Kit was Christopher. Christopher Marlowe. I'm like, oh, you're the best writer. And, and he's actually quoting some Faustus and talking about, oh, I would love to write like you and, and you're the best and I wish I could write, I can't write at all. And he's like, who are, who's that guy? He's like, ah, oh, he's kind of crap. His name's, um, name's Will, Will, uh, Shaxbeard, Will Shaxbeard, which is William Shakespeare. And he's like, uh, you know what? I hear you want to make, you, he says something. Let me go back to it. Uh, I would give, this is William saying, I would give anything to have your gifts or more than anything, to give men dreams that would live on after I'm dead. I'd bargain like your Faustus for that boon. And then Dream picks up, you know, hears that and says, okay, this guy's willing to give anything to give men dreams, kind of do his job. So he makes his deal. He says, um, I heard you talk, Will. Would you write great plays, create new dreams to spur the minds of men? Is that your will? It is. Well, let us have a chat. Right, so he goes and talks. He's going to make this deal with William. And we don't really know what the deal is, but we know that in theory, you know, the dream, dreaming is kind of like influencing William Shakespeare, which I think is kind of fun. Again, it's incorporating some history. It's incorporating those kind of like ideas to it. I like it. Um, and so 
that's it. He's like, let's meet again 100 years. Let's do it. It's all up. It's all going up. I love this life, right? 100 years later, uh, I love, love the costume again. He's waiting for waiting for, uh, for Robert. And this guy comes in. He's like a ragamuffin, you know, disease and ridden, poor. And he's trying to get into this, this tavern. And he and dreaming is like, no, he's my guest. Come in, come in. He's my guest. Let him in. And he's like, I knew you'd be here. Do you know how long? You know how hungry a man can get if he doesn't die, but doesn't eat. You know how hungry that man could be. Uh, and now we realize, you know what? Living forever isn't so wonderful. And living forever, there's a cost to that. It's not always going to be up, but it's going to be like the market, up and down. And so this last 100 years was miserable, the last 80 specifically. She died, his wife Eleanor died, the kid died in a brawl. He, because he lived so long and got overconfident, he got tried as a witch, they tried to kill him, destroyed all his money, you know, destroyed his, his things, he was destitute. And he lost everything. And then Dream says, well, you still wanna live? Don't you want to seek a respite of death? You're so miserable. The last 80 years have been unbearable. And he says, are you crazy? Death's a mug's game. I got to go live for it. So even after the misery of, of everything, I mean literally everything, to the point of death, he says, no, man, let's do it. Another 100 years. He has that faith. He has that interest of... I gotta keep going. There's an adventure, I can bounce back. It's a mugs game. I find that fascinating. It's just a really cool story, a really cool idea. So, jump another 100 years. Again, we don't know the time. We know the time because we can add, but it, he doesn't say that. I love that, that it's, you gotta think about it. There's just, this part of the, a good writing is not telling everything, right? Um, we gotta let the, the, the reader think a bit. So now we're still at the White Horse Tavern. Uh, now, but it's a little different because there's this woman, this blonde woman that's coming in to the tavern with a couple big blokes. We don't know what's going on, but they're listening. And here we are. And he's back on top, looks like. He's well-dressed. He learned some things. Uh, the shipping, he got a little more involved in that and he became a smuggler in trade. He traded bodies, slaves for cotton and rum and tobacco. And he was a part of the slave trade. He made a lot of money through that. And this woman here, this blonde woman, has heard stories of a man meeting, about these two men that meet every 100 years. So she's came to investigate. And actually she wants to know the truth of this. This person is Joanna Constantine. Joanna Constantine would be the, you know, I don't know, great, 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 great grandmother of John Constantine, a character that uh, would be first introduced in Swamp Thing by Alan Moore. But this kind of investigative British supernatural paranormal investigator uh, evidently comes from this line of those people, like a Van Helsling kind of character. So she comes to kind of bust them. She's like, I'm going to take you guys. I want to learn about what's going on, how are you living forever, and what this is all about. And a dream he doesn't play. And he's just like, you know what? I don't think so, girlfriend. And she starts seeing her ghosts, uh, her, you know, horrors. And so she's paralyzed. The other two guys are, are knocked out. Uh, so she's done. But... He will use her later on, and there'll be some stories that they kind of uh, work together in some way. So she's, you know, she's a, a tool that Dreaming will use in the future. So he says, uh, you know, are we going to do this another 100 years? Yeah, but let me tell you something. It's a poor thing to enslave another. I would suggest you find yourself a different line of business. So that's his comment about the slave trade. Another hundred years ago, now we're in um, kind of Jack the Ripper, uh, Victorian, Edwardian time. Uh, 
Of course, this girl tries to get him to shag him, kind of a pro hooker, prostitute, talks about Jack the Ripper a little bit, just to kind of give us the time, timing of this. Uh, and he enters in the, the tavern. And there he is again. There's Robert. Now Robert says, um, you know, he, he stopped the... Oh, they talk about the blonde girl. Yeah, they talk a little bit about um, how Joanna, and he says, uh, I've used her a couple times in the past. Dreaming does. And he mentions there's other people he's noticed that are also kind of immortal. This guy named Blood and these other people. And um, Mad Hattie is another person who, who's lived a long time. And so he talks about death's a capricious thing, isn't it? And then he says, talking about his sister, yes, yes, she is. You know, I think I know why we meet here, century after century. It's not because you want to see what happens when a man doesn't die. You've seen that what happens. I doubt that I'm any wiser than I was 500 years back. I'm older, I've been up and down and up again. What I've learned, what I haven't learned from my mistakes, but I've made more time to commit more mistakes. You're right about the slave trade. I can never make restitution for that. But listen, I've seen people and they don't change. Not the important things. I doubt I'll ever seek death. You've observed all that, but you knew it from the start. I think you're here for something else. So he talks about how he's lived these lives and he's made mistakes, but he keeps making them too, different ones. But it's not like you become wiser and all-knowing and suddenly you don't make mistakes, you become perfected. You just make different ones throughout your life. And he's seen people and how throughout the ages, people are the same. You know, the, they don't change. The mankind, the, the, the human condition doesn't change you know, throughout the ages. And that's, that's kind of a, a theme, an important thing that, that Gaiman's kind of hitting on this. But he says, I think you're here for another reason. And Sandman says, well, what is that? Friendship. I think you're here because you're lonely. Now, at this, Dreaming gets completely indignant. And he's like, how dare you? How dare you? Might imply that I might befriend a mortal? That one of my kind needs companionship? How dare you call me lonely? He's like, yes, I do. I do call you lonely. Tell you what, I'll be here in 100 years time. If you're here too, then it'll be because we're friends. No other reason, right? He waits 100 years to see what happens. 100 years. Never knowing if he's ever going to see him again. Maybe the pact is over. Maybe he dies by saying this. By, by questioning Dreaming's uh, reasoning for, for being together. By sussing out the real truth that he was here because of missing a friend. And needing a friend. And he doesn't know what's going to happen. And I love this. Now we're in 1989, and it's the 80s. We hear talking about Thatcher and the wars and the, the, the kind of constant problems now that are happening in the 80s. And he's waiting he's all alone by himself. And he goes, I, I wasn't sure you were coming. And I love this. this is, I get chills. And he's like, really? I've always heard it was impolite to keep one's friends waiting. Would you like a drink? That's great, man. That's just great. Because you don't know how it's going to end. It's a great feeling how they've ha they, be they became friends. That through these interludes, through these four, five hundred, six hundred years, they've met and had these little chats. And he was right. Dreamy did want a friend. And Dreamy could have never saw him again. But he came back and he called him a friend. And I don't know, man, that touches me. That's just like a great freaking story. And Neil Gaiman does this time and time again in this series and other works. But I just love it. It touched me. It's emotional. It got me. It got me in the feels. This is just, and it's just a random freaking issue because the next ones talk about the serial, the serial convention. So it's, but it's, I think it's one of his best. So there you go. I love it. Issue 13. 
uh, Neil Gaiman, Sandman. I hope you guys enjoy this video. I really enjoy talking about this kind of stuff. It's brilliant storytelling. And uh, thanks a lot for watching, guys.